low plasma sodium, high urinary osmolality, high urinary sodium. That is a catalog of anomalies that we associate with the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis. This tutorial looks at a couple of cases of this disease. We look at the causes of SAAD and also the treatment. Hyponatremia, part three, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis and cerebral salt wasting. Welcome back. In the previous tutorial, I discussed hyponatremia and body volume status. I discussed the treatment of acute symptomatic hyponatremia and how you work the problem of the hyponatremic patient. Finally, I discussed when not to treat acute hyponatremia. This time I will discuss the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis and cerebral salt wasting. First, I want to start with a term that you may not be familiar with, aquaresis. This is the capacity of the kidney to excrete electrolyte-free water. What I mean by that is, when electrolyte levels are low, they are retained and water is excreted. Aquaresis is impaired principally due to vasopressin, that's antidiuretic hormone secretion, that may be associated with stress or cardiovascular failure, or it may be inappropriate associated with myriad disorders. Impaired aquaresis is strongly associated with aging where there is a reduced glomerular filtration rate and reduced ability to concentrate urine but also there's reduced salt and protein intake as people get older they often don't consume enough protein we also see it during the stress response where water is held on to because of the production of antidiuretic hormone as part of fight and flight to preserve the rel let's start this tutorial with a clinical scenario you're called to see Nick, who is 53 in the emergency department. He presents with nausea, shortness of breath, and lightheadedness. He has a history of asthma and is a non-smoker. And on his chest x-ray, he has left lower lobe consolidation. On his labs, his plasma sodium is 111 millimoles per liter. Of course, we need to work this problem. So let's start off with his electrolytes. Sodium, 111 potassium 3.4, chloride 98, creatinine 89. His glucose and urea are normal 4 millimoles per liter of each and his measured osmolality is 234 milliosmoles per kilogram and there's no osmol gap. So this is hypotonic hyponatremia. In this setting it's imperative that we look at his urine. His urinary osmolality is 140 milliosmoles per kilo so Nick is concentrating his urine. His urinary sodium is 42 millimoles per liter. So Nick is losing sodium. In this setting where the creatinine is normal, the urinary sodium is relatively high and the urinary osmolality is high. There is one principal diagnosis you must consider, the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion that these days is mostly known as SIAD. The syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis. Again, isovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, high urinary osmolality, high urinary sodium. Now if you see this picture, you must outrule adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism before you settle on this diagnosis. And there are medley causes of this disorder. I want to warn you, there's a long boring list ahead for the next minute or two, but it's imperative that I go through it. The first cause of SIADH are neuropsychiatric disorders, infections, meningitis, encephalitis, brain abscess, vascular problems, thrombosis, subarachnoid or subdural hemorrhage, temporal arteritis, cavernous sinus thrombosis, stroke, brain neoplasms, primary or metastatic, skull fractures, traumatic brain injury, psychosis, delirium tremens, and then all kinds of other stuff. Guillain-Barre, acute intermittent porphyria, autonomic neuropathy, post-pituitary surgery, MS, hydrocephalus, lupus. So these are brain injuries. And the first thing you think about when somebody comes in and they're seizing with hypotonic hyponatremia is a brain injury. The second cause is cancer or the so-called ectopic ADH secretion. The most common one of these is small cell carcinoma of the lungs. Two thirds of patients with small cell carcinoma have impaired water excretion. 
but also bronchogenic carcinoma, duodenal, pancreas, thymus, olfactory, neuroblastoma, bladder tumors, prostate tumors, uterine tumors, all can produce ectopic ADH. Lymphoproliferative diseases like lymphosarcoma, reticulum cell sarcoma, mesotheliomas, Ewing sarcoma, Hodgkin's disease, leukemia, a whole array of cancers can cause ectopic ADH. We also see it with a bunch of drugs. Now, I'm not going to show you all the drugs, but generally antipsychotic agents, these are the SSRIs, antidepressants and anticonvulsants are notorious for causing SAAD. Likewise, opioids can cause it. We also see it with pneumonia and mechanical ventilation. One time that you will see this in your clinical practice, but may not be aware of it, is an appropriate antidiuretic response, and that is when somebody has surgery or anesthesia or critical illness. In that situation, the patient produces lots of antidiuretic hormone. This becomes problematic if you resuscitate the patient with large volumes of hypotonic fluid. We have also historically seen a problem where patients were having transurethral resection of the prostate, where there was a lot of glycine given to wash out the surgical field with poor surgical technique. That glycine, which was essentially just pure water, was entravasated into the patient. The patient's sodium dropped very, very quickly and they could have seizures. The treatment of SIADH depends on the cause, but I will tell you that the principal therapy is water restriction. The, in a nutshell, approach to treatment is as follows. Look for an iatrogenic cause such as hypotonic fluid and discontinue it. Look for a drug-related cause and discontinue the drug if at all possible. Institute water restriction immediately. Check thyroid function tests and serum cortisol and treat if abnormal. If the patient has neurologic signs, you must image the brain. And then do a CT of the chest, abdomen and pelvis looking for cancer. If water restriction isn't enough, consider using salt tablets and diuretics. Alternatively, you can use urea, demeclocycline or vaptans. One of the approaches to hyponatremia in this setting was developed by FIRST, originally published around the year 2000. FIRST basically claimed that dilute urine has two components, isotonic fluid, which is electrolyte rich, and water, which is electrolyte free. And you can measure the electrolyte free and electrolyte rich components by looking at the different ratios of sodium and potassium between urine and plasma. And once you figure out the amount of electrolyte free urine excreted, if you restrict water intake to below this level, then plasma osmolality must rise. This is the calculation from first. It's the urinary sodium plus the urinary potassium divided by the plasma sodium. So once you've done your calculation, three different options may occur. First, the result may be less than 0.5, it may be between 0.5 and 1, or it may be greater than 1. If it's lower than 0.5, then you should restrict the patient to less than 1 litre per day. If it's 0.5 to 1, then half a litre of fluid restriction is indicated. And if it's greater than 1, then there is no indication for fluid restriction, in which case you're looking at alternatives like Tolvaptam, or chronic treatments such as using urea. Now, Nick has pneumonia and hyponatremia. Would he benefit from fluid restriction? Let's work the problem. His sodium is 111, his urinary osmolality is 140, his urinary sodium is 42, and we've also measured his urinary potassium, and that is 28. Let's use the first equation. Urinary sodium plus potassium divided by plasma sodium. Let's feed in the results. 42 plus 28 divided by 113. And the result is 0 0.53. So if you're in agreement with the system that FIRST proposes, then you should fluid restrict Nick to fewer than 500 mils of fluid per day. Now, although fluid restriction is considered the standard of care for SIADH, it's really hard to get patients to abide by it. 
they'll always sneak in some extra fluid some way or other. There also are situations where fluid restriction is likely to fail. For example, if the urinary output is less than 1.5 liters per day, it's not going to work. If urinary osmolality is very, very high, more than 500 milliosmoles per kilogram. And indeed, a randomized controlled trial showed that only 17% of patients with one liter of fluid restriction had a sodium rise of five millimoles per liter in four days. So what are the alternatives? Well, quite an attractive alternative is the use of urea. Urea, while given orally, has been demonstrated to reduce intracranial pressure by eight to 10 millimeters of mercury with a single 15 gram dose. The reason why it works is that it promotes an osmotic diuresis. And urea is also believed to restore acroresis. The daily dose regimen is 0.25 to 0.5 grams per kilo per day. This is the product that we use. And what's quite nice about this, this comes in sachets and it's flavored. The taste of urea is ucky. And this particular product has a lemon and lime flavor. There are other products with different flavoring. And for this, generally 215 grams sachets dissolved in water are given to patients. May I suggest though, that in my experience, many of our patients that we treat with chronic hyponatremia are elderly and underweight. And we sometimes call this tea and toast hyponatremia. These patients would likely benefit from increased dietary protein intake. They would make more urea themselves and that would have a massively beneficial effect if you believe in urea on their serum sodium. Now there are some data to support the use of urea. This is a systematic review that was published in October 2023 in the JAMA Open Journal. They looked at 23 studies of SIDH. 462 patients were treated with urea. The pooled mean baseline plasma sodium was 125 millimoles per liter. The median treatment duration with oral urea was five days and within the first 24 hours the mean increase in sodium was five millimoles per liter and there were very few patients who had overshoot. Over the course of therapy the mean increase in sodium was approximately 10 millimoles per liter with no real complications, side effects or overcorrection. The great benefit of urea of course is that it's really inexpensive. Now, there are alternative inexpensive therapies, such as the use of low-dose furosemide intravenously or orally, such as 20 milligrams per day, combined with salt tablets, for example, sodium chloride, 600 milligrams per tablet. The starting dose is 600 milligrams TID, that's 1.8 grams, but this can safely be increased to target specific plasma sodiums, usually 130 millimoles per liter often up to five grams per day is required. Just so that you're aware, the 600 milligram tablets contain 10 millimoles of sodium and 10 millimoles of chloride. I want to discuss how antidiuretic hormone or arginine vasopressin works. In this cartoon, I have laid out a picture of the collecting duct and on the left hand side, we have the extracellular space on the right hand side the tubular lumen through which urine flows and in the middle the collecting duct the collecting duct separates the two it's a cellular structure and it's normally impervious to liquid to control the porosity of this particular cell there are two components that you need to know about the v2 arginine vasopressin receptor and the aquaporin channel the aquaporin channel facilitates water moving through the cell but normally it's not attached to the membrane it's floating around the cytoplasm of the cell when a patient becomes dehydrated there is an increase in plasma osmolality and this is detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus this results in the release of adh antidiuretic hormone vasopressin from the hypothalamus and it's sent down into the posterior pituitary and thence into the bloodstream vasopressin attaches itself to the v2 receptor in the collecting duct this causes a chain reaction that involves cyclic AMP and protein kinases and ultimately results in the opening of aquaporin channels in the cell membrane. Water then moves across the osmotic gradient into the extracellular space. Vaptin drugs such as Tolvaptin, 
bind to the V2 receptor and compete with antidiuretic hormone. This results in the closure of the aquaporin channel and excretion of a dilute urine. So tolvaptin may be indicated for non-nephrogenic SIADH. It's highly effective therapy for increasing plasma sodium versus fluid restriction, and it appears to retain effectiveness for several years. Well, that sounds great, but the drawback is that it's very, very expensive. If you need to use it, the initial dose is 15 milligrams per day, and it can be increased up to 60 milligrams per day. The original paper promoting the use of Talvaptam comes from the European Journal of Endocrinology in 2011 as part of the SALT trials. And as you can see, the higher curves represent the increases in plasma sodium associated with Talvaptam, so it seems to be a very effective therapy. Keep in mind, though, that 1 in 20 patients in this trial had an overshoot of their sodium target. They overcorrected. What other agents are available? Well, demeclocycline has been available for many decades. It's licensed in most European countries for treating patients with SIADH. And what it does is it induces a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. I will say, though, that the evidence supporting the use of this agent is not great. Newer drugs such as sodium glucose co-transport 2 inhibitors seem to be also effective at restoring plasma sodium. They induce glycosuria and an osmotic diuresis and they may turn out to be quite a useful tool in the treatment of this particular disorder and they should be considered if your patient has SIDH and type 2 diabetes but there are other issues with these drugs they may cause renal dysfunction and they're known of course to cause ketoacidosis. Let's return to our patient Nick. Recall that Nick had community acquired pneumonia, he had mildly symptomatic hyponatremia and he was treated with antibiotics and steroids, fluid restriction and hypertonic saline initially. He was then put on urea 30 grams per day and his sodium increased to 122 over 2.5 days. He was subsequently discharged home later on in his care with a plasma sodium of 138. We didn't rest on our laurels to suggest that Nick had pneumonia-induced SIDH. We did a bunch of other blood tests on him. We also imaged him from head to toe. But by the time of his discharge, we were confident with the diagnosis of pneumonia-induced SIADH. Let's look at another scenario. Hilda is 68 and she's a history of smoker's lung disease, COPD, and she's admitted to the ED with confusion and a plasma sodium of 113. Now, when we did a chest x-ray, this is what we saw. And you can see that there is a large pleural effusion on her right side. Now, Hilda needs hypertonic saline therapy to resolve her hyponatremia, but don't lose sight of the underlying process. This may be pneumonia or it may be something more sinister. So we came along and we drained the pleural effusion. And now that the fluid that was in her thorax is gone, you can see that there is a large hyalur mass present. So this is SIADH caused by bronchogenic carcinoma. Let's move on to another scenario. Rebecca is 34 and she's had a severe headache for three days. On examination, she has a third nerve palsy and mild right-sided hemiplegia. There is T-wave inversion across the anterior leads on her ECG. Her plasma sodium is 123 millimoles per litre and this is what her CT brain looks like. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is subarachnoid hemorrhage complicated by hyponatremia. Let's work the problem. Plasma sodium is 123, potassium is 4.2, chloride is 102, and creatinine is 100. So only the sodium is abnormal in her electrolytes. Her glucose and urea are both normal, and the measured osmolality is 262. So this is hypotonic hyponatremia, and we've calculated the osmolarity because of the possibility that she's had a big bolus of mannitol, and the calculated osmolarity is 262 also. So there's no osmol gap. 
looking at the urine, the urinary osmolality is 180 milliosmoles per kilo. So Rebecca is concentrating her urine. Her urinary sodium is 50 millimoles per liter. So Rebecca is losing sodium. So this is a situation that occurs only in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage and it's known as cerebral salt wasting. Now I know what you're thinking. I've just shown you a patient who has a low plasma sodium, a high urinary osmolality and a high urinary sodium. Why is this not SIADH? And it may well be, but this is cerebral salt wasting. And the big difference between this particular disorder and SIADH is that cerebral salt wasting is associated with hypovolemia. The patients have a big diuresis and they need to be resuscitated. SIDH, the patients are usually isovolemic or hypervolemic. So this particular patient, aside from the management of her subarachnoid hemorrhage, either clipping or coiling, depending on what time scale we're at, and also some prophylaxis for her potential vasospasm, she will need a resuscitation with isotonic fluid, usually isotonic saline solution or, for example, plasmolite 148. We could also give her some salt tablets if she's able to swallow. I will point out that this is usually a transient problem and that when it resolves, it completely resolves and the patient no longer has a problem with hyponatremia. She may well develop a diabetes insipidus in the future as part of the problem of having an intracranial hemorrhage and she may become hypernatremic as time goes on. Let's review this tutorial. In this tutorial, I discuss the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis and explain that this is something we see with surgery and critical illness, but it is pathologically associated with community-acquired pneumonia, certain drugs, many cancers, and other disorders. It is characterized by hypotonic hyponatremia. The patient is euvolemic or hypervolemic. Urinary osmolality is high and urinary sodium is also high, more than 30 millimoles per litre. Treatment of symptomatic hyponatremia associated with SIADH is exactly the same as everything else, and that is hypertonic saline. The standard treatment once the symptoms have abated or if the patient has no symptoms is fluid restriction. And then if that doesn't work, there is a stepwise treatment protocol starting with urea, then possibly frusamide and salt tablets, and then moving on to more complicated treatments such as demeclocycline and tolvaptam. It's my view over time vaptans will become the treatment of choice for this disease, but at the moment they are too expensive to be used universally. Cerebral salt wasting is a very similar disease that complicates subarachnoid hemorrhage. Typically, there is hypotonic hyponatremia, but the patient is hypovolemic. There is a high urinary osmolality and a high urinary sodium. The treatment is fluid resuscitation with isotonic fluid. This is typically a self-limiting disorder associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Next time, I will discuss rates of correction of plasma sodium and what to do if you overcorrect. And then I will also discuss the disease that everybody worries about with overcorrection of dysnatremias, and that's osmotic demyelination syndrome. That's also known as central pontine myelinolysis. I'll see you then, and I guarantee you'll learn something. So that was the syndrome of antidiuresis. If you're enjoying these tutorials, please subscribe on YouTube or follow me at ccmtutorials.org. Next time, complications of hyponatremia.